Good morning. Welcome to this talk on the discovery of Varana Upaparam. The Vedic Reserve website, mum.edu slash Vedic Reserve, aims to collect together the Sanskrit texts of all these 40 branches of Vedic literature. Some of the texts that make up the Vedic literature, such as texts in the field of Shiksha, in the field of Upaparana, and in the Agama branch of Sthapatya Ved, are only available in handwritten manuscripts. We have been searching manuscript repositories in India and in Europe to locate and transcribe the remaining missing texts to make the collection of Sanskrit texts on Vedic reserve complete. One such unpublished text was the Varana Upaparana. Vivek Bhajanathan found the manuscript of Varana Upaparana in the holdings of the Government Oriental Manuscript Library, called GOML, in Chennai. The manuscript was written on paper in Telugu script, and the pages were sewn together in the form of a book. The pages were extremely fragile, tending to break when turned, sometimes at the break losing the first couple of letters of each line of the page. The script is modern Telugu script. There are twelve chapters, only, beginning, only the beginning and ending verses published by GOML Chennai have been known to scholars heretofore. So today you are some of the first to hear of these ten delightful stories of the exploits of Lord Shiva contained in Varana Upaparana. Some of the stories are found also in other Puran, while others are unique to this Upaparana. Chapter 1 provides the circumstances and context in which the knowledge of Varana Upaparana was given out. Shaunaka and his disciples assembled on the banks of the river Saraswati and invoked Lord Varana. Lord Varana appears and agrees to make clear to them the nature of the great Lord Shiva through stories of his heroic exploits. Here a quote from the book. These amazing, charming, and entertaining stories of the heroic exploits of Shampu, Lord Shiva, handed down by tradition, are in truth the descriptions of the infinite dynamism of natural law in the unmanifest. I am here recounting a few of these stories. Always keep in mind the deeper purpose to make clear the divine nature of the pure unmanifest self. One should appreciate the stories of the great Lord Shiva in this way as the teachings of the eternal knowledge of the self. Chapter 2, entitled The Interpretation of Legends, continues the dialogue between the rishis on the banks of the Saraswati and Lord Varuna. Lord Varuna presents the special and unique vision of this Upaparan. He reviews the storylines of all the ten stories to follow and explains the metaphor and symbology of each story. He explains that the anecdotes should be understood as presenting the knowledge of samadhi and the inner enlightenment and the progressive development of higher states of consciousness, cosmic consciousness, God consciousness, unity consciousness, and Brahman. From beginning to end, the characters in all the stories told of ancient times in the Puranas embodying all possible values of organizing power of natural law, represent the innumerable values of rishis and devatas and chandas in the Veda. Chapter 3 presents the first and perhaps most amazing of all the stories, the supreme knowledge of Vedanta, the knowledge of the ultimate, the non-dual Brahman, is presented in storyboard form. The final steps on the path to full awakening are recounted in a story which purports to explain the circumstances in which the Brahma Sutra were spoken out 
for the first time. In this story, Agni explains to the assembly of the gods the successive experiences as the brilliant celestial vision of God consciousness is transformed into the supreme ultimate experience of totality, Brahman. The atmosphere of the assembly of the gods was filled with excitement and anticipation for the knowledge that was so deeply desired by them. The immortals, having invited the divine Agni, he, the teller of the story of two fullnesses, approached the assembly. Chapter 4 tells the story of Shveta, the son of a king in ancient times. A soothsayer comes to the court and predicts that the child Shveta will not live to maturity because of physiological imbalances evident from his birth chart. The king begs for knowledge that will avert this calamity, and accordingly the soothsayer initiates the child into the practice of yoga. When the appointed time comes and the messengers of Yama arrive to take the child away, the child is deep in samadhi and is not visible to them, and they return to Yama empty-handed. Yama is enraged and comes himself to that spot and throws his noose around the entire unbounded being and starts to drag him away. The child, deep in samadhi, cries out to Lord Shiva, and Lord Shiva arrives, draws a circle around the child, saying that the child is under his protection and gives him a new lifespan of a thousand years. Sitting in meditation, deeply absorbed in the experience of the transcendent when the day of his expected death arrived, Shveta was clothed in white, clothed in absolute purity, not locatable within any time-space boundaries, hidden in the transcendent, completely invisible when the messengers of death came to bind him and take him away. Chapter 5 tells the traditional story of the destruction of the three aerial cities of Tripura by Lord Shiva. The gods come to Lord Shiva asking for help against the ravages of the three demon cities called Tripura. Shiva is invested as the commander-in-chief of the gods. He marches to battle with his army, draws an arrow and places it on his bow, and then waits for a thousand years for the right moment when the three aerial cities are perfectly lined up. Then, with a single arrow, he destroys the three cities, and the gods are restored to their proper stations. When the aerial cities are coursing through the atmosphere separately, it will be unwise to attack, because if we try to attack one city, the other cities will retaliate from their superior positions in the air. In order to destroy the three cities of Tripura, we have to wait for that moment in the course of their aerial paths when all three cities come together as one. Then we can attack all of them simultaneously, Shiva said. Chapter 6 tells the well-known story of the destruction of the sacrifice of Daksha. Daksha was a Brahmin well-versed in the Vedas and in the procedures of performance of Vedic yagyas. His, his daughter was the goddess Sati, the wife of Lord Shiva. One day she appeared with her retinue, consisting of millions of warriors, and asked why she and her husband had not been invited to the horse sacrifice that was underway. Daksha protested, that he was performing the sacrifice as it had been laid down since ancient times. The goddess Sati became furious and with her armies laid waste to the sacrificial ground. The priests and the gods of the sacrifice were beaten and the deity of the Yajna was beheaded. Daksha sought protection from Lord Shiva and, blessed by him, was healed of his injuries and relieved of his pain. Thereafter, Daksha performed many great sacrifices, always careful to invoke the ruler of the gods, Lord Shiva, for the sake of the success 
of the sacrificial performance. Appearing with Shiva's hordes, her enormous retinue of millions of warriors of all imaginable shapes and sizes, Mother Divine, with her attendants, completely surrounded the sacrificial ground, inundating the whole vicinity as far as the eye could see in all directions. When the enormous clamor of their arrival had subsided, Mother Divine, the wife of the Supreme Lord of all creation, spoke to Daksha, her father. Chapter 7 tells the story of Brahma, the creator, who sat to create, but was unable to create. Vishnu whispered to him to meditate on his inner self, where resides Lord Shiva, the ultimate cause of creation. Experiencing the rapture of the self, he praised Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva responded by creating the eleven rudras, fundamental balancing principles responsible for creating the evolutionary stream of all the beings in creation moving through cycles of life and death. Then Brahma was able to create the creation. Once upon a time, the Creator desired to create duality and manifest this vast and diverse universe out of the undivided, unmanifested wholeness of Brahman. The lotus-born Brahma was unable to create. The universe was not coming up, was not bursting forth. What was needed to bring an end to this humiliating failure of the Creator to create? Chapter 8 tells the story of Shiva and Mother Divine coming to earth and moving about disguised as mendicants, worshipping the Divine and performing great austerities. One of the oldest and most experienced monks in the forest where they were living recognizes them and calls them out, and then all the monks of the forest recognize them, seeing through their charade. The monks thus enjoy a shortcut to realization of the divine and enjoy the bliss of Brahma Loka. All the ascetics of the forest were then initiated into the practice of transcending, were given Rudraksha beads to use as rosaries, had the trident drawn on their foreheads, and learned to recite the Shatarudriya mantras of Yajurveda in large groups. In this way, they were established in the knowledge of the path to higher states of consciousness. By seeing the Lord Almighty and Mother Divine for their true selves, the ascetics instantly attained the abode of Brahman, enjoying the bliss of the highest heaven, Satyaloka. Chapter 9 is the story of the life of the Devas at the time of universal dissolution, when there was no creation. Then, the Veda is self-existent, and there is nothing else. There is the in and out breath of the Veda. There is also the memory of creation stirring within the unmanifest, unbounded wholeness. It is a story where nothing is happening. Then Shiva fondly remembers Mother Divine and the whole creation expands quickly in all directions, bringing the state of dissolution to an abrupt end. At that time, because the universe is in its least excited state, the womb of all the impulses of speech of the Veda is self-existent, established in its own nature. At that time, Mother Divine is the primordial breath or pulsation of totality, the wholeness of the speech of the Veda first expands in the womb, and then the expansion contracts and is let go. Chapter 10 tells the story of Skanda, described as the principle of fertility, which connects the creativity of the individual suktas and mandalas of the Veda with their integrated expressions at higher and higher levels of complexity. Skanda was made the commander-in-chief of the army of the gods, 
and led the gods in the battle that destroyed Taraka and the demons that embodied the destructive forces of nature prevalent during the time of universal dissolution. Then the mountain-born Mother Divine, having been fully cognized, fully known, fully brought to awareness, Lord Shiva took the process one step further, placing garments on Mother Divine, and thereby concealing all the fine inner mechanics of the process of creation. Chapter 11 tells the story of the demon Andaka, who chanced to see Shiva and Mother Divine sporting at the top of the mountain. Disturbed and unbalanced by that perception, he became a great destructive power, destroying the gods in great numbers. He challenged even Lord Rudra to battle, but was defeated and impaled on Shiva's trident. Thus impaled, he felt contrition and praised Shiva and begged for forgiveness. Shiva was pleased by his praises and raised him up, granting him life and healing his wounds. He was given a position in the ranks of administration of Lord Ganesha and given the boon of an all-seeing eye. For the sake of one who had renounced his evil ways, Shiva, who the moment before had fought against him with great fury and finally impaled him on his trident, now went in the opposite direction, restoring him to life and granting him boons. For the sake of one who renounced his evil ways, Lord Shiva, who had moments before impaled the demon and killed him, now quickly went in the opposite direction, restoring him to life and conferring boons. Chapter 12 describes Mother Divine on the summit of Mount Kailash as night was falling. As the silence of the night settled in, she witnessed the great dance of Lord Shiva. Shiva's dance was the move of totality, incorporating all beings in its drama of universal harmony. The gods, angels, and sages praise the dancing of Lord Shiva, content in seeing the wonderful dance of the eternal continuum of silence. At the end of this chapter, Lord Varuna concludes his exposition of the growth of higher states of consciousness in story form is duly honored by the assembled rishis and returns to his palace in the world of the gods. Lord Vishnu, the administrator of the universe, was moving to the rhythm of the drum, and Brahma, the creator of the worlds, was clapping his hands to the beat, and Lakshmi on the flute, and Saraswati on the Veena, exquisitely skilled musicians played the first most delicate impulse of natural law, the primordial stir of totality. We have seen that the text itself lays out the theme of interpretation of the ancient legends, understanding the stories as representing in sequence the experiences of the higher states of consciousness. The experiences of higher states of consciousness are proposed by the author of Varuna Upa Purana as the master key for analyzing and understanding all the stories in Puran. Higher states of consciousness have always been there throughout the ages, so this is truly ancient and eternal knowledge. The proper role of Upa Purana, according to Marishi, is to provide a path to Puran, to make the knowledge of Purana understandable and practically realizable. Systematically unfolding the sequence of experiences of higher states of consciousness is certainly providing a path to Puran, a path to the ancient and eternal, timeless reality of being. Varuna Upa Purana brings such great light and clarity to the whole field of Puran that we naturally ask, what is the authority of this text? What is its authenticity? There are three points to verify the authenticity of the text. The author, 
Maharshi Shaunaka was a disciple of the great sage Vyasa and himself an enlightened sage with numerous great accomplishments. The Pala Shruti, the verse at the end that tells the benefit of the text, predicts mastery of all the branches of Vedic science by studying the text. And indeed, the stories demonstrate fulfillment of every discipline of knowledge by realizing the self, making this prediction reasonable. Here are some examples of different disciplines of Vedic science exemplified in the stories of Varna Upapurana. Examining the structure of the text and laying out the twelve chapters in a circle or mandala, then we see that the principles of an eternal structure with opposite chapters, contradistinct and complementary, that is established for the mandalas of the Veda, those principles of eternal structure are upheld by the relationships between the constituent chapters. We conclude that Varna Upapurana is an original source text of Vedic literature, a treasure of all mankind, useful and true for all men and women in every age.